So we're on the last section here, which is documentation and communication. So you've collected all this physical and behavioral information about the animal during this first hour, and now you can use that to categorize animals. And so one way that is commonly used to categorize animals is using these Asilomar definitions. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this being that this is a Maddie's Fund webcast. And so what a Silmar is, in case you haven't heard of it, is a way of categorizing animals in the shelter and determining whether they're unhealthy and untreatable, they're treatable, or they are healthy. And I just want to point out a couple of areas that tend to be confusing about using the Asilomar cord. So the first one is demonstrated by this slide here. And you'll notice that I've got the arrow um, from all the different categories going out to a successful adoption. So the status that's given to an animal, the Asilomar status, doesn't necessarily define its outcome. It's just a way of categorizing it so you can track the information. So in some cases, even unhealthy, untreatable animals may be able to get adopted. So the next thing is who do these, does the Asilomar um, definitions refer to? And I've got some quotes directly from the document there. So it's community-based. It's based on what reasonable and caring owners and guardians in the community would do for their pets and how they would categorize their pets. So a lot of shelters might categorize animals based on what they can do for them in the shelter. And that's not actually the way that these guidelines are meant to be used. There's lots of information on Maddie's Fund's website about how to actually go about figuring out what your community thinks should be in each category. The second thing is that the Asilomar definitions talk about both physical and behavioral diseases, so you don't want to forget either side of that scale. Remember, with one without the other leads to an unbalanced situation and an unhealthy animal, so we're talking about both physical and behavioral health. And then the last thing is when you're actually reporting these categories. And so um, the guidelines are a little bit vague, but they generally ask for you to report the Asilomar status under euthanasia statistics. And I would really encourage you to, to count, these, um, count these descriptions both at outcome as well as at the time of intake, which is why I'm talking about it now during this discussion of intake. So think about how useful it would be to know if an animal came into your shelter healthy but left sick. You'd want to know that information, so you'd want to figure out why did that happen and how can we make it better. On the same time, wouldn't it be great to know if an animal came into your shelter sick but left feeling much better? That would be a great thing to report out to your funders and donors. So with that, we'll see what you guys are doing. Okay. For shelter administrators and managers, at what point during an animal's time in the shelter do you record his or her Asilomar designation? Okay, so it looks like 3.6% people, uh, percent of people said at intake only, 4% said at disposition only, 15.9% said at intake and disposition, and 18.6 said we don't use Asilomar definitions, and 57.7 said not applicable. All right, so hopefully I've uh, given those who are only categorizing at intake or only at disposition a couple ideas, and maybe you'll consider categorizing them at both time points just to kind of give yourself a check and see how you're doing. So Asilomar is one way of communicating externally with the public and with funders, but you can't forget about communicating internally within the shelter as well. So you've collected all this great information during your intake exams, and you've got to be sure that you communicate that to your staff. So you're going to have daily observations on every animal, and usually that's performed by the animal care staff every day. So are they eating? Are they drinking? Are they doing okay? Um, you're going to have what's called daily rounds, which is performed by a daily rounds team. And the point of this is to identify the physical and behavioral needs of the animals, each animal, each day, and actually create a plan to respond to those needs. And then finally, for animals that are identified as needing veterinary care, the veterinary staff is going to have treatment records that they're um, using to check on animals that are under veterinary care. And so, again, I'm talking about this now because all these things are going to have to be identified at intake, and the animals are going to have to be set up to have these, to be on these various lists of rounds at the time of intake so that they're not forgotten. <laughs> 